is never untrue for your life. And that is that you're a child of God. You are loved by Him. You're securely held in His hands. That means you have a place. You have a, a place in, in His house, a place with Him that no one can take from you. No one can take you from that place. All of the other identities, all of the other things can pass away and can disappear except the fact that you are a child of God securely in his hands. And today, he's given you a family. He's given you brothers and sisters to walk through this journey alongside. So whatever you're going through, I would pray, I would urge you to open up your heart this morning to a brother or sister in this place and let them in on what you're walking through because he has called us as the body of Christ to bear one another's burdens, to weep with those who weep, to rejoice with those who rejoice. And we want to do that alongside you. Amen? Over the past uh, two weeks, I really didn't even uh, plan or intend for this time what I, I believe to be such a, a, an important season and time in the life of our church. But uh, beginning with a message about two weeks ago, I believe that this is a, a very important season. There's a very important message led by the hand of God for our church and for the church at large. And I've been laying the groundwork over these past two weeks for something that's very important for every single believer in this room, beginning with Jesus' words found in John 10.10, 10, where he says, I have come that you might have life. And then there's many different translations that follow that particular statement. The one I prefer from the Berean Study Bible says, and life in all its fullness. You've heard abundant life. You've heard life to the fullest. What I love about life in all of its fullness is life in all of its fullness to me and my mind, it sounds like wholeness, completeness within. So life in all its fullness. And why that is important, and a lot of it is even just down, uh, just a few days ago I witnessed this again. Now it's becoming uh, more and more, uh, uh, I'm becoming more and more aware of witnessing this. If someone just asks you, why did Jesus come for you? Why did Jesus die? Why, did, why do you believe it? Well, he came, he died for my sins that I might have new life. Is that your answer, right? That's how we respond. And yes, that's the first half of that sentence, right? Jesus says, I have come that you might have new life. That's what we think, and that's how we typically respond. But what I've been emphasizing, and I'm going to continue emphasizing, I believe it's something this important, not just for a moment, not just for a season, and not just for a sermon series, but I believe uh, uh, almost the undercurrent of the life of the body of Christ, the thing I'm going to continue to emphasize is that the majority of believers stop living uh, before the end. I have come that he might have new life. We've settled there. But Jesus says, and life in all its fullness. The way in which we were designed, the way in which we were created to thrive, to flourish as mankind is found in the work of Jesus, what he came to offer. We have been, we have received new life. And the question that I continue to pose, I began two weeks ago, I was asking it again last week, is this, are you experiencing life in all its fullness? If you were just to examine your life, because Jesus didn't just come to give you new life by his own admission, he came to give you the fullness of life, meaning, purpose, value, satisfaction, wholeness at the deepest level of your being. Are you experiencing fullness of life? As I asked people the very first week that I began this, because, of the, because my feeling and my, the conversations that I have, I believe the majority of believers, there's so many people who would say they still feel like something's missing. I, don't, I just don't quite feel complete. I'm not actually satisfied 
at the deepest level of my being, but I would, yes, claim I have received new life. But where's this fullness? Where's this abundant life? Where is it? How do I receive it? Is it just supposed to be there? Was it supposed to be present? Why is it not in my life? And I believe that that truth resonates with the majority of people walking out the Christian life today. There's something I'm still not getting. There's something that, I'm, that still seems to be missing. I think a helpful illustration of this is when I think of receiving new life, but there's also fullness of life available to me. A helpful illustration is, is this. I like the, the, the imagery of a banquet table where many of believers who've received new life have settled just for the crumbs that fall from the table. Meanwhile, the Father's extending an invitation to come take your place at the table and eat your fill of this endless supply of spiritual food, of fullness. Don't settle for the crumbs that are just down there. I've invited you to come and to sit at my table. Life-giving nourishment, the endless supply. Come, sit at the table. This life, this invitation that I'm sharing there in this particular banquet table imagery is available to everyone who's received new life in Christ Jesus. This is available to us. But the question is, if that's true, why aren't we experiencing it? Why am I not experiencing fullness of life? Because as I just mentioned a moment ago, we would all admit something doesn't quite feel complete. There's just something that's still missing. I'm not fully satisfied. Or this other side of it, maybe it's not all just about uh, f- fullness and blessing and, 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 and that side of things. Maybe it's I have deep wounds. There's deep scars within me. There's sin, there's unforgiveness that remains, infecting what might otherwise lead to a full life. Because some of the voids within have to do with wounds, have to do with hurt, have to do with unforgiveness, which prevents us from receiving a fullness from the Father. So how do we receive that wholeness, that fullness, that healing? that completeness within. And I'm telling you today that life doesn't have to be like that. Life doesn't have to feel partially full as I repeat over and over and over again. I'm not satisfied with merely being saved and hanging on till the end. I'm not satisfied with a partially formed or a partially full life. I want absolutely everything that God wants to give to me. If there's a true, full human spirit experience to be received from him, I want it. I want the recipe for it. I want the blueprint for it. I want the framework. I want whatever it takes to receive that life. Because that's what it is for every, almost everyone in this room. Because I, I don't know everyone's place, but I would almost say everyone in this room is a believer. What remains for us is fullness. What remains for us is life in all its fullness. And this life, this healing. And, and, and I, I, I want to add this. It's, I almost skipped this, but I think it's that important. This fullness, this uh, completeness, and in some instances, in some of our lives, we're thinking, well, these circumstances have to change, or my conditions, or the things that I've experienced, these things don't have to be gone, these things have to be changed. No, this fullness, this wholeness is available in spite of what life looks like, in spite of what I've experienced, in spite of things that I think, if this thing isn't gone from my life, there's absolutely no way I can experience fullness. And God's saying, nope, uh uh-uh, fullness is available. This life I speak of, this healing from within that I speak of, this fullness is found in following Jesus. 
it's, it was my, my point last week. It was last week's message really centered on being a disciple or an apprentice. The question each of us must ask, though, is this. Do we claim to be followers of Jesus, or are we actually following Jesus? There's a difference. The purpose of last week, the real big point of uh, last week's message was trying to clear up this, this particular uh, uh, separation we almost have of being a Christian and being a disciple. But if you are a believer, you are a disciple. You are a follower of Jesus. The question just remains, are you actually following him or are you just claiming to follow him? That was last week's emphasis. If you're a believer, you're a disciple. You laid down your life, and you took up your cross, and you followed Jesus. There was a cost involved with it. Leaving this as the most important discovery of our day, the most important thing we can figure out for each and every one of our lives is how do I follow Jesus with the life that I live in 2024? with the life that I have, with the the family that I have, with the resources that I have, with the job that I have, with the life that I live, how do I follow Jesus today? Or how do I reorient my life, restructure my life that I may follow Jesus more intentionally? That my efforts, my habits, my choices, my decisions are more intentionally to follow Jesus. And that's where I want to begin this morning. I want to begin laying out this three-part vision of living life after the end in John 10.10. How we live life after the end. I've received new life and what does that life look like? How do I receive that life? And that life begins... It begins, it's centered on, but it's not a step that we progress past. This step is being with Jesus. It's step one, but it's not a step we go past. I think that's important. It's not we be with Jesus and then we move on to the next step or the next stage. Being with Jesus is the foundation of it all. It's at the center. It's at the core. But before we begin that. Before we look at being centered on Jesus, there's some things for us to consider about our lives. A question that we should all consider, and I think it's very important. I, I, honestly, I'm, I feel really passionate about this morning's uh, message, and I hope it resonates with your heart. I pray that it resonates with your heart. Something I think we should all consider about our lives, and that is this. This question, what is it that I want from this life? What is it that I want from my life? Maybe we've not even really considered that. Maybe we're just kind of, um, that, that word sounds negative, but maybe we're just a little bit aimlessly living our lives. Just the next thing that's in front of us, just doing it, just choosing it, without really ever considering what do I want out of my life? Day after day. What do the choices that I make say about what I desire most in this life? If you were to look at the decisions, if you were to look at the routines, if you were to look at at the rhythms of your day, what does it say about what I want out of life, what I desire most? That looks different for every person in the room. Because choices are a big part of our lives, our culture places a significant emphasis on choice. I often use this illustration of our particular uh, kind of uh, consumerism uh, world, the consumerism world we live in. I use this illustration a lot when I, if you go to the grocery store and you go to, uh, well, any aisle, but I use the example of ketchup. You go to the ketchup aisle, there are 10 brands of ketchup. There are five sizes of ketchup. Several of them have different flavors added to the ketchup. Some are organic. Some have no high fructose corn syrup. The list goes on and on and on. There's time and time again, I have a list of things I'm supposed to get at the grocery store. And I go to that aisle, and I'm like, I'm just looking for the original one. 
I just need the one, and I come home, and Amber's like, that, that's not it. You, you missed it. It's low fat, or it's, you know, like, I, I missed it. The sugar-free. Whatever it was, I, I thought it was, the, there, were, there were 80 of them. And I grabbed that one, but it was the wrong one. Choices abound, do they not? Isn't it overwhelming? I can even, I'm not that old, but I can remember a time when that, there weren't that many choices. There weren't that many choices. But this is a silly example, obviously. But I would venture to say, I'm not that old, I've not lived um, uh, as long as some of you have. I would venture to say we've never had more choices to be made in life in all of human history. I can pretty confidently make that claim. You've not had as many choices, as many decisions to make in your life as you do at this very moment in 2024, living as uh, probably specific to the Western uh, world, specific to even just America. You've not had this many choices. We've not had this many choices. We have more choices to entertain ourselves, more choices to educate ourselves, more choices to move and to travel, choices abound everywhere. I can pick up my phone and I can, I can do anything almost. I can learn. I can just uh, disappear from uh, this present moment. I can read. I, can, I mean, it, I can watch videos. I can do anything. I can doom scroll, if you've ever heard that term. Choices. My point is this. In our modern era, we are conditioned to have a consumer mentality. With the freedom to make all kinds of decisions for our lives, some essential, some not. Ketchup, for example. With that freedom, though, we often to fail. We often fail to ask deep questions about the direction of our desires, at the root of our being. The direction of our desires at the root of our being. Begging this question, what do our choices say about our desires? The things that I'm choosing, not the catch-up decisions. The other decisions to choose, what am I doing with my mind? What am I doing with my heart? What am I doing with my body? Where are my feet taking me? What are my hands leading me to? What do they say about what I want most in life? Or more importantly, what do they say about who I am? What do they say about the identity that I have? The purpose that I've been given, why I exist, why I live. Day after day, I'm free to choose as I please. I will take one of those, not one of those. I will go here. I will not go here. Even this morning, we chose Those of us chose to get up and to get ready. It was raining outside, but we still chose to brave the rain and to come and gather with his body. We chose that this morning. But as the late Rowan Williams says, he says this, making these kinds of choices, making them in this way, this treats our will, our choosing, as a series of disconnected, fractured acts of choosing, expressions of the surface of what I want what I desire. And lost in all of this disconnected freedom of choice, all of these series of decisions that may not add up to one central idea, one central purpose, what what I really want or what my identity really is, wrapped up in all this disconnected freedom of choice, we lose touch with the deep desires that actually make us who we are. And who we are, is image bearers, created with a yearning to be loved by God and to love him in return. We were created in a certain way. And the desires and the wants in our lives are surface level, superficial um, responses to what the deepest yearnings, the deepest longings of the way in which we were created to live. But how do these decisions, how do these choices factor in to that reality of who we are, why we we were created to exist? 
what happens with this series of disconnected choices is we lose touch with the reality that there is a current in our lives moving us toward a goal. But what is the goal? That's the question. As I asked a moment ago, what do we want in lives? What do we want in our lives? What is the North Star directing us to one place? What's the goal? Are the, and the question being, are these choices, the choices in my life today, the decisions, are they pointing me in that direction? Because if I want to follow Jesus, if that's what I want in my life, if I want to become what God wants me to be and created me to be, to experience life in all its fullness, then I have to make certain choices that move me toward that goal. If that desire, as we all express, as I heard from many voices in the congregation a moment ago, if the life we desire is to experience all that God has for us, to actually experience life in all of its fullness, then the series of decisions, the choices that we make, have to add up to point towards that goal. They have to be in line to get us to that end. It's not going to happen by accident. We're not going to stumble into conformity to Christ's image. We're not going to stumble into fullness of, of life it's going to require a certain it's going to require certain decisions and certain choices in our life in our routines in our habits to get us to the goal the question is is it the goal as we consider what is it that i want in life and wh- what do my decisions what do my habits what do my choices today actually say about my goal regardless of what you would claim your goal to be Because often, many of us may say the right kind of goal, but what are the choices, what are the decisions I'm making today say about what I'm truly becoming, say about where I'm truly headed? Because as I said, if I want to follow Jesus, if I want to become who God wants me to be, then I've got to make the right choices that move me towards that goal. And following Jesus, being formed in his image, living abundantly is not something that's going to happen by accident in our lives. Achieving that goal requires a series of decisions that begins with, but doesn't end with being with Jesus. This is the bedrock, being with Jesus. But as I mentioned earlier, I want to press in on what does that actually look like in our modern culture because it's easy for me to stand up here and just say go be with Jesus and you take whatever practice whatever understanding that is from your uh, view from your vantage point and you just go and apply that in your life that's not enough I am driven too much by application I guess I want to give us some meat of what that actually looks like so I believe the best place to begin Looking Now we'll get into the text. This is all just intro. Hope you're ready. Good thing we got lunch today. The best place I begin, I think, that, uh, to begin looking at this practice of being with Jesus, just to, to intro, just to begin, begins in John uh, 15, 4 through 6. I'm not going to go in great depth of this particular topic. I did like a four or five part series last year in the beginning, and so you can go back and exhaust um, all of that, the, the time that I spent doing that. But John 15, 4 through 6, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, it, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. Let's pray. Father God, I ask that you would open our hearts and minds to hear from you this morning. I pray that your spirit would illuminate truth this morning. Would stir us up to living lives that are with you, that remain in you. I pray that the words that I share, Lord, be born of your spirit and not of my flesh, and they would encourage and equip and build up this body 
to help us all not settle, but to experience the fullness of life that God has to offer to us. In your holy name we pray. Amen. The first thing, I'm going to breeze through this text because this really isn't my core text for the morning, but uh, the first thing I want to point out in this text is Jesus' command, abide in me. To abide with Jesus, you know, notice this, it's not presented as a choice. It's not among a list of choices. Jesus says it is the only way to be fruitful. It's the only way to produce fruit and that anyone who does not abide and it's fruitful, will be like a branch that withers and is thrown away. So being with Jesus is essential for discipleness. First and foremost, because this is a a command from Jesus, first and foremost, it's about faithfulness. And then it's about fruitfulness, producing fruit. And the life that is faithful and the life that is fruitful is a life that flourishes flourishes as it was designed to exist. So if we're going to be faithful, we must abide. If we're going to be fruitful, we must abide. If we're going to flourish as humans, as mankind, we must abide. And at the center of abiding in the vine or being with Jesus is the Word of God. Can't be disconnected from it. It is at the core. John 8 uh, 30, verses 31 through 32 says, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Reading the word, hearing the word, meditating on the word are core practices for abiding with Jesus. We spent time on this last year. Like I said, if you want to go back and hear uh, uh, much more spent on this particular topic, you can. But this is how we know the heart of the Father, through his words and through examining, exploring, reading about the life of Jesus. Not just what did he teach us, but where did he go? Where does his feet lead him? How did he live? How did he dwell with the Father? And as John 8 reveals, this is the way that we are set free. This is where the bondage of false identities, patterns of sin, lies of the enemy are dispelled and the people of God are set free. So spending time in the Word is essential to abiding. Also, prayer is essential to abiding. Talking to the Father. Listening for the Father. And so daily rhythms of prayer in the Word are essential to being with Jesus. But everyone in the room knows this. Do you not? Everyone in the room has heard this, right? And I would venture to say that most believers in the room today have some type of regular reading or prayer routines as part of your life, right? But many of which would claim that you still feel like something's missing. These routines exist. These rhythms exist in my life, but they're still not fullness. They're still not this uh, uh, fullness of life that seems to be presented here. And so if that's you, this morning I want you to open your heart this morning, hopefully to a, a deeper experience of being with Jesus. John chapter 1. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 36. When he saw Jesus walking by, he said, speaking of John, when he saw Jesus walking by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. And when the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following. What do you want? He asked. They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come and see, Jesus replied. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the tenth hour. First and foremost, to be understood, discipleship. As these disciples uh, are, are mentioned here, discipleship is defined by how we live. Not just the decisions that we make, not just the things that we believe, but it is a, a state of being. 
It's more than learning and application. It's being with Jesus in a way that we begin to live a life with the characteristics of Christ woven into the fabric of our very being. As I've mentioned multiple times, it's where our natural impulses and reflexes and responses look like that of Christ. And the first chapter of John provides this example of what this being with looks like. Here we have two disciples of John that ask Jesus, where are you staying? And he says to them, come and see, and they spent the day with him. First of all, these guys just abandoned John. You notice this, they just, hey, we were following you, John, but you just said that's the Lamb of God. We're out of here. He said, come and see, we're following him. Now, notice he could have easily, very easily, just told them where he was staying and went on his way. Could he not? But he didn't. He wanted them to come and see the place that he was staying. See, later on in the same gospel in chapter 15 that we just read a little bit of a moment ago, this same language for spent the day, where it says that they spent that day with him. This same language gets translated as staying or abiding, which describes Jesus' command to his disciples to abide in me and to abide in my love. So John begins his gospel in chapter 1 with Jesus' invitation for these disciples to come and to see where he abides or where he stays. And then they remained with him for the day. And I don't believe that it's by accident that John places this particular encounter in the beginning of his writings because the reality is if we're going to understand what the rest of the book of John teaches about discipleship, we're going to have to understand abiding. And what does he do? He opens the chapter with this staying with, this remaining abiding. Abiding is about remaining. It's to dwell in a place, to make your home somewhere. So what makes you and I disciples, what makes us disciples isn't coming to Jesus every once in a while. It's not coming once a week for a lesson or a sermon. It's not carving out uh, a few minutes in the morning or in the evening. It's not an intermittent state. It's a relationship that continues without pause. It's a remaining with, it's to make our home with him. And as I pointed out last week, What discipleship or apprenticeship looked like for the earliest disciples was this, listening to the rabbi's every word, observing him, imitating him, staying by his side constantly. It was doing whatever they could to remain close to him, to absorb anything and everything that they possibly could about him, watching every move, listening to every word. And so you might be thinking, I see where uh, these disciples went to see where Jesus was staying, and they spent the day with him. But we can't go to where Jesus is staying, can we? We can't follow him like that. But I want us to get this, because I think this is really important. I think one of the most important, even though it would seem like, well, we can't follow Jesus and go to where he's staying and sit and spend the day with him. I still think this is one of the most important invitations to come and see where I'm staying. I think it's one of the most important invitations we hear from Jesus regarding being with him. In John 14, 16, Jesus says that he will ask the Father, to give us an advocate to be with us forever. The word advocate can be understood as someone like him, someone like Jesus. So this advocate, the one like Jesus, known as the Spirit of God, as we would know it, as we would reference it, known as the Spirit of God is in us and around us, right? We know this. The Spirit of God is in us. He dwells or abides in each one of us. So here's this 
question. Here's this thing we're thinking about. How do we go and see where Jesus is staying? How do we go there and remain with him? Here's this beautiful truth. If today you're wondering where is Jesus staying? Jesus, where are you staying like the disciples? Where are you? Where's your home? If you're seeking to find where the master is dwelling, his invitation to us today is, uh, his invitation of come and see today, here's what this would look like in our day. If he were to say, come and see where I am dwelling, here's what it might sound like. Child, I'm with you and I'm in you. I'm right here in your presence. I'm working all around you. And then he might say something like this. Pay attention. I'm here. I'm with you. I'm near you. Pay attention. Become aware of my presence. All you need to do to see where I'm staying is to open the eyes of your heart. We don't have to seek out where Jesus is staying. We've been given the advocate, the Spirit of God. He is here. He is in our midst. He is with us. He is working around us. You see, the Spirit of God is always present. It, sorry, if the Spirit of God is always present, then one of, if not the most important practices of being with Jesus is awareness and attentiveness. If the Spirit is always with us, and our goal, our aim, the bedrock of our formation is being with Jesus, then our attention and our awareness are at the forefront. If we don't know where Jesus is and we're searching for Jesus, it is because our attention and our awareness is elsewhere. Why? Because He is here. He is in me. He is around me, working. And so if we're going to remain with Jesus, and we're going to follow this invitation to come and to see where he is staying, then it's the invitation that's also come and see where he is active and speaking. If we're going to achieve this, then we must practice a state of awareness, which can be done at all times. It can be done in every place, everywhere we go, everywhere we sit, everywhere we travel. Awareness that his presence is near me. It is living with an expectation that we're going to hear from him at any moment. That we're going to see his work, that we're going to see his glory on display or that we're going to receive new understanding by what we see, hear, or experience at any moment of time. But this awareness or attentiveness or expectancy of his presence requires a type of inner stillness. The busyness, the, the constant hurriedness will not allow us to live with this kind of attentiveness and awareness and expectancy of what God wants to do. This might require a new pace of living. It might require new habits of living. I used this analogy because I thought it might resonate with some. It might be similar to the approach that a deer hunter requires of quiet, stillness, and patience, and attentiveness to any movement nearby. Got to wait, got to watch, got to get still, got to get quiet. Or that of a, a bird watcher, intently waiting on that rare specimen that I'm waiting to see. I have to be ready at any moment to see. I'm waiting, I'm still, I'm aware, I'm attentive. So at the first level, this practicing being with Jesus means learning and deepening our attentiveness to the Word of God, to the ordinances of the church, and to the life of the body of Christ. We listen for Him in His Word and through His body with the expectation 
that the Spirit will bring illumination or understanding. Praying and expecting that we will change. That should be a desire of all of ours, that we are going to change. Firstly, it's that practice. Secondly, arising out of this, we learn a new level of attentiveness to all people, all places, and all things, looking at everything with an eye of expectancy, waiting for God, uh, for something of God to begin to reveal itself. That while in communion with Jesus, we're still and we are waiting and we are alert to see the light of truth peering through the darkness at any particular moment, not just here, not just in this place, but everywhere that we go. Why? Because where he is staying is where we are. It's where we are going. It's where we are walking. It's where we are uh, taking ourselves. And then third, it begins with being attentive to where Jesus is going, keeping in company with those that he is with. And following Jesus in that way leads us to some unlikely people. If you want to follow Jesus, if you want to see where he's leading you, it might not lead you where you hoped to go or expected to go, to some people that we might not usually associate with, but the people that Jesus regularly found himself in company with, time and time again. Following Jesus, where Jesus is now and where Jesus went time and time again, will also lead us to the Father. If you follow the life of Jesus... You're going to be back in the arms of the Father, sitting in his presence, conversing with him, praising him, getting alone and still with the Father. A life following Jesus, remaining where he's going, will always lead us back to the arms of the Father over and over and over again. And so with attentiveness and awareness and expectancy towards God's presence, with that attentiveness, awareness, and expectancy. As followers of Jesus, we are then thrust into action in life and in our world as a spirit-formed presence in the place that we already walk in and out of day after day after day, allowing a a God-shaped change to take place around you in your world. Because we're attentive, we're aware. He is near, he is with us, he is guiding us. That is where he is staying. And this isn't achieved through hard work or through struggle, but by slowing down moment by moment, being aware that Jesus is saying to you, come and see where I'm dwelling. Come and see where I'm leading you. Come and see where I'm at right now in your life life in this very moment as you sit in this place today. As you sit where you're at right now, looking around you, you become aware and attentive to the the presence of God's Spirit. How is He leading you? How is He guiding you? How is He informing you to respond to this very moment right now? Because the reality is, I shared this a couple weeks ago, the majority of people in this room, the majority of believers in church today, we don't actually need more information. We need the pace and the space for the Spirit to apply the information that's already tucked away, that's already within, to tell you that what you're, who you're really looking at. Here's some examples. One way that this information is applied by the Spirit to tell you who you are really looking at is not an enemy, but a soul who's lost and needs to be saved, loved by the Father. To tell you who you really are, that you're not a great or terrible employee, dad, mom, son, daughter, but you are a child of God. To know that you aren't here just to make an income. 
Your, job, your, your world doesn't just consist of waking up day after day just to make an income, but rather that your job, your work within the work, your work within your job is to be a spirit-empowered presence in the lives of others and then to glorify Him in the excellence in which you do your job. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to ask the question again as I finish up this morning. What do I want in life? And how is my life structured towards that goal? Are all of the decisions of my life disconnected from who I really am and why I really exist? Because if you're a believer, our goal and what we want from life is being conformed to the image of the Son. To be conformed to the image of the Son, bringing glory to the Father. So I want to encourage you this morning to hear the invitation of Jesus found in John chapter 1, to come and to see where he is staying. And then make the important decision, as these disciples did, to remain with him there wherever he is staying, wherever he is moving, wherever he is going. I'm going to remain with him through his word, through prayer, through listening. But the special emphasis this morning that I really wanted to key in on is through remaining attentive, aware, and expectant. Why? Because the place that he is dwelling is in you, it's near you, and it's guiding you. Come and see where he is dwelling. And know today, he's in us. He's around us. If we're not aware, it's because it's, it's on our own part. It's because we're distracted. It's because our minds are somewhere else. It's because our decisions are somewhere else. It's because our thinking is somewhere else. It's because we've convinced ourselves we're here for some other purpose. Life is about something else because that's where our minds and our hearts are. But if we decide this is who I am because this is who God says that I am. This is why I exist because this is why God says that I exist. Now we can sit with a level of attentiveness and awareness that I am a part of his body, placed here for a specific purpose and a reason in this particular moment of history, as I am today at this very moment, at whatever time it is, past my time, 1130, that this very moment, God placed me here for this very time in front of these very people. And you were here for in that same way. God saw to it. He's here. He's with you. Bow your heads this morning, if you would. Father, I pray that you would give us eyes to see. I pray that you would give us attentiveness, awareness. Help us to live with an expectancy. Help us to slow down our lives, to live for the purposes that you've called us to, to look and to observe, to see your hand at work, to see where you are dwelling day after day after day after day. Help us in our awareness. God, give us the discipline to remove distractions. Help us to find the things that are distracting us from the truth of your presence, from the reality of your presence, Lord. Help us that we may become aware that we may then be part of your kingdom because this is the path. This is the way to flourishing. This is the way to fullness of life, to live in the way in which I was designed to live, connected to the one living for the one, filled with life then by the one. Help us this morning, Father. Help us get a new vision of what life in your kingdom looks like. Help us to expand our imagination for what could possibly result in fullness. Not the things we think, but trusting in your ways. Trusting that being with Jesus 
is at the core of our focus, the core of our attention, the core of our being is to remain with him at all times. Help us in this practice, Lord, as we begin to leave this place, as we begin to stand up today and we have conversations with our brothers and our sisters today that you are here and we are seeing where you're dwelling. Give us attentiveness. Give us awareness. Help us in our expectancy, Lord. We want to be part of where you're moving. We want to be part of where you're acting. And we want to experience all that you have for us today. All that you have for us in this life, day after day after day. Help this word plant deeply in our hearts today, Father. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, now consider the food blessed.